Hello everybody, welcome to another episode of Ask Boxing Science, where we answer your training questions. We've received a question about the trap bar deadlift. You know, do, do we choose a trap bar deadlift or do we go for a conventional deadlift? And the reason why we get this question so much across our social media channels is because we do a lot of trap bar deadlifts and people want to know the benefits of you know, the reasons why we choose this over a conventional deadlift. Before I get into answering that question and a few different tips around uh, deadlifting, I just want to give a big shout out to our YouTube sponsors, Saga Fitness. Saga Fitness are specialists in BFR cuffs, blood flow restriction training, and their BFR cuffs are available on their website. They're highly effective on improving strength and hypertrophy. If you're wanting to grab a pair of BFR cuffs, check out the link in the description and also uh, use the discount code Boxing Science to save yourself 10% off their upper and lower body cuffs, or you can get a bundle of both. The trap bar deadlift is an effective exercise for boxing. There's multiple reasons why, I'm gonna cover this now. The, one of the key reasons are these handles for a couple of reasons. The handles are raised. So a boxer will struggle to get into the start position of a deadlift due to poor hip mobility and postural stability, and maybe the shoulders as well. So when they grab a conventional deadlift, it kind of rounds their posture and they have to get a little bit lower. These handles are raised, so they don't have to go down as deep. And also, because they're in a neutral position, it's easier to get that scapular retraction to make sure that you keep a nice straight posture during the deadlift. Now, a conventional deadlift, because it's in front, makes it quite anterior dominant in the shoulders and quite hard to maintain that scapular retraction, especially when you're going under increased load. So if we are going to do conventional deadlifts with our boxers, one, we're putting them under a little bit more strain through their lower back and keeping the, them shoulders pinned back. So it's increasing that likelihood of injury whilst lifting, which is something that we don't want to do. But also we're, we're very keen on maintaining that technique whilst lifting heavy because of the safety aspect, but also making sure that we're getting the most out of the exercise. So we'd only limit our boxers to the technique that they can keep. Now, if you're finding it quite hard on the conventional deadlift to maintain that posture, that will limit the amount of load that you're lifting. So that will limit the, the strength adaptations. And in, in a 10 week training camp for a boxer, we wanna optimize the adaptations um, during training camp so a boxer is in peak physical condition when they get into the ring. With a trap bar, because it's easier and it's a safer uh, technique, we're able to load it up more. So we're hitting 2.2, 2.3 times body mass with some of our elite boxers here at Boxing Science they would not be able to achieve that uh, when they're doing a straight bar deadlift. And even though there's many benefits to a straight bar deadlift, we want to get our boxers strong. We want it to increase the rate of force development. So we need to find a way of him, like optimizing that. There's a saying of training the adaptation and not the exercise. So with the trap bar deadlift, we're not training the deadlift movement um, for powerlifting or anything like that but we're optimizing the load, we're optimizing the rate of force development, and we're optimizing the adaptation so our athlete's getting stronger and faster. So now I'm gonna just uh, go through some of the pros and cons of conventional deadlifts and trap bar deadlifts. So let's go through some of the pros and cons of the conventional deadlift and the trap bar deadlift. So even though I'd prefer to use a trap bar deadlift with our boxers, we do put the conventional deadlift in their programs, especially early on. The reasons why is that it strengthens the posterior chain more compared to a trap bar deadlift, and also it transfers to Olympic lifting. So if you're wanting to get your boxer uh, doing like clean pulls or clean variations or uh, snatch variations as well, this has a bigger transfer to Olympic lifting than uh, a trap bar deadlift. Getting on a straight, getting on a straight bar, learning that deadlift pattern, this will transfer to a clean pull. There's no point doing all of our foundational work, doing trap bar deadlifts, ignoring the conventional deadlift, and then just expecting our athlete to be able to 
uh, perform Olympic lifting variations. So it's important to keep this in the program, especially early on. But the reasons why we don't use it to get max strength adaptations is because there's an increased activation of the lower back. So this is increasing the chances of uh, injury because our, uh, our boxers will tend to want to use the lower back over using the hamstrings and the glutes during this action. Uh, it's harder technique, so that makes it harder to load. So it's not being as safe and as effective as a trap bar deadlift. And also it doesn't transfer to a uh, popular exercise that we use at Boxing Science, the trap bar jumps. So the same way that a conventional deadlift transfers to Olympic lifting, where a trap bar deadlift doesn't, a conventional deadlift won't transfer to uh, performing uh, the trap bar jumps, which is a key exercise that we use during the strength speed and speed strength phases. Now trap bar deadlift, just go over the pros again. Uh, it's an easier technique to perform. This makes it easier to load. So it's a safer and more effective exercise technique. And also it transfers towards our trap, uh, trap bar jumps, which are highly effective in increasing the rate of force development. The, some of the cons are that it doesn't transfer to Olympic lifting, like I just mentioned. And also it can be knee dominant because we've got the handles, because we're more like squatting down into the deadlift position. An athlete could tend to be in a more upright position than they would do on a conventional deadlift. So this means that it becomes more knee dominant and doesn't challenge the posterior chain as much. So in this next section, I'm gonna go over some of the key coaching cues when performing a trap bar deadlift. So now I'm gonna demonstrate how to perform the trap bar deadlift. We step into the bar with our feet hip width apart and on line with the center of the bar. So on line, with the fulcrum of the bar here. A key mistake would be to go too far forward or too far back. You just want to be just in the middle. When we come down to pick up the bar, we want to keep the shoulders pinned back and we want to hinge at the hips as we come down. Where hips are just above the knees. Remember what I just said earlier is that the, a lot of mistake would be to be too upright and it become a knee dominant movement. We push the hips back. So the hips are just above the knees. When we lift, we pull our shoulders back, we drive into the floor, and then lift nice and explosively. Obviously this depends, the speed of the bar depends on how much load, but we want to try and lift as quickly as we can each time. Take a deep breath in before we go, a lot of tension, take the slack out of the bar, and then drive up. So now I'm gonna go over some of the key coaching cues to eliminate some mistakes that I see in the gym. The first one is not taking enough slack out of the bar before you lift. So an athlete can want to lift as fast as they can as we've cued just earlier, but start lifting. They get into a nice start position, but as soon as they start lifting, they lose the posture because they're trying to lift as fast as they can. This is because they're not taking the slack out of the bar. Now, a key coaching cue that I use, hopefully Jamie can put a nice video over this, is uh, like a sp you want to deadlift like it's a space rocket launch. So when they're counting down from, I don't know how far they count down, probably five minutes, but let's say for the last 10 seconds, is where you start seeing the jet fuel coming from the rocket, but the stabilizer is still on. So they're creating that energy before the space rocket goes. And that's what you wanna do when you're doing a deadlift. You create that energy, you're pushing through the floor, you take the slack out of the bar, you create that stability prior to lifting. Okay, so it's a little bit like a space rocket. If that space rocket isn't stabilized, um, whilst it's creating that energy, well, it'll just fall over and crash. And this is what happens with a deadlift. If we don't create that energy first, take a deep breath in, push through the floor, pin those shoulders back, and then drive up, it creates for a safer and more effective lift. Now this also transfers into the second one. Second key coaching cue is, instead of performing three reps or five reps, I tell the athletes to perform three or five single repetitions. And what I mean by this is not just 
coming down, tapping, and, and performing the reps as quickly as I can. I say to when they get to the bottom, they, they rest, they reset, and then they repeat. So using the three R's, rest, reset, repeat. And what this does is maintain that posture whilst you're fatiguing in the reps and making sure that you're putting optimum force and optimum speed into each repetition. What you tend to do when you're just repping out is end up losing the posture and also losing that speed and intent. So when you rest, reset, repeat, rest, reset, shoulders pin back, repeat that movement. And you're going into the each movement with a safer technique and also optimize rate of force development. And then the final one is making sure you're getting a solid hip extension. So when we're driving our hips through, we want to get our hips in and under to make sure that we're squeezing the glutes and optimizing that glute development. What I tend to see is that boxers will start to use the lower back and lean into the movement and start overcompensating with their lower back muscles. What you want to do is when they extend, get them hips and under, keep the core switched on and extend to just on line with the arms. You don't want to be going past your arms. You want to keep your arms pinned back and keep the hips on line with the arms. I'm trying to think of uh, some more. Another one is the bar position. You can see that the bar can go either way. You don't want to be starting with the grip and, and the bar being unbalanced. You want to make sure that the bar is balanced before you go. And then also if you're struggling to maintain a posture or be able to lift heavy weight or during the trap bar deadlift, don't be afraid to go from the blocks, but just make sure that you're going with a hip dominant movement. So to review, uh, the key coaching points for a trap bar deadlift. Making sure that we're lifting like a space rocket, create that tension, take that slack out of the bar before you lift. Use the three R's, rest, reset, repeat. Don't be just repping out and losing that posture and losing that intent. Make sure that you're approaching each rep with optimal technique and optimal force production. Making sure that we get that hip extension right, we're not overextending using the lower back. We want the hips tucked in and under, uh, extend aggressively and making sure that we're uh, squeezing the glutes. The bar position is important, not only the start to make sure that the, uh, the bar is on line with the, um, sorry, the center of the bar is on line with the shins, but also making sure that it's not tilted forward or tilted back prior to lifting. And then make sure to use blocks if you're struggling with your postural stability during the lift to make sure that you're getting the most out of the exercise, not only from a, um, from a strength training perspective and trying to increase that rate of force development, but to make it safer. Okay guys, if you've got any questions about any of the stuff that we've covered in this episode, or you've got any questions for future episodes of Ask Boxing Science, please leave them in the comment box below, or you can email me at dannywilson at boxingscience.co.uk. Cheers guys, thanks very much for watching, and hopefully see you on the next episode.